give a, an overview of the summary, and then we have discussions distributed in four uh, portions. And after each portion, we would have a set of questions to ask, and then we might open the floor to the general public, and then you also can ask your questions, and then we move on to the next section. So, yeah, we can start. All right, so we summarized a bit the general ideas in one diagram. Of, um, yeah. So you can see first that there's cities from the global north in which uh, that are going fast and now start slowly to go a bit more slowly. And then here's cities in the global south that go in the opposite direction, starting slow and now going fast. And this is due to two main forms of power um, that are talked about and we interpret it as two different forms of power. First, the material power uh, that is economical and political and that constraints the access of resources of cities in the global south. This is about uh, investment, uh, global organizations. And then you have also discursive power, uh, which shapes actually uh, the aspirations of the global south and cities in the global south. It's about discourses, about the development model. Uh, and aspirations are seen as the, the south needs to catch up with the global north. And this is what it aims for. Um, so this leads to the South accelerating faster and faster. Um, it used to be in an environment uh, that was more working with slow rhythms. So here, as you can see, rhythms that are endogenous, contextual, well-adjusted, uh, communitarian, democratic, and most importantly, sustainable. And that is now adopting more and more rhythms uh, that are fast coming from the global north, capitalistic, more top-down, uh, also replicable and not sustainable. So this creates a lot of problems, uh, increase in risk, uh, exotic urbanism, a disconnection with the periphery around that is sometimes still working with slow rhythms. Um, yes, and uh, also we read also another paper uh, based on in the case of India, we can see that the risk factors are a bit divided between factors for the cities themselves. Uh, there's increased segregation, problems with public services, social exclusion and ecological sustainability, and then yeah, also the disconnection with the periphery, uh, leading to a concentration of resources, so it leads to even increased problems for regions that are also outside of these big urban centers. Then the way forward is to slow down, to follow a different path, and to uh, try to have a reflective, m reflective modernization process in which the Global South would actually think the future they want to reach. And this is based on the Eurythmic urbanism. So then the kind of new form to oppose these two different powers is to uh, democratize processes of decision making and also of uh, ideas and uh, about the discourses and so there's the idea that slowing down would help democratic processes to uh, arise and also democracy would then help to even slow down further. Yeah, I think just by uh, yeah. So the, the four topics that we would talk briefly about, and in the end we'd, we'd have like one question mainly for each of these topics. Um, if you have questions also about exactly these topics, we can open the floor after each of the uh, yeah discussions. So first about rhythms, then about other countries across the globe. Third about slow urbanism in the global south, and fourth with where to start. Uh, so the first topic is rhythms and eurythmia, which is a huge part of the paper. Um, so um, the paper talks in abstraction about these ideas, so I just wanted to talk about some of the experiences of uh, what fast development really does to rhythms in India. The next slide. Uh, so, um, so this is the this is the specific portion that uh, we felt um, was in the paper that 
uh, I wanted to discuss, which talks about a contradictory process of assimilation, um, which excludes several cultures, um, and there are rhythms that are dominated and dominating. Uh, and we have two examples of this. Uh, so the first one is time. So uh, I just want to talk about some of the rhythms that exist in India and how they're being broken. First, in relation to time. The first is Indian standard time. So uh, it's a well-known fact that Indians are late to everything. Um, uh, it, we, we run, it's called Indian standard time. You're half an hour late to everything. Uh, and uh, a lot of, like during the colonial process, this was considered, like during the post-colonial uh, process, Indian standard time was considered a huge hindrance to development. If you're ha half an hour late to everything, if your systems don't fu function on time, then obviously you don't have development. However, like last year, I spent my time in Italy, and there also everyone is at least half an hour late. <laughs> but over here, it's not Italian standard time. It's called Le Dolce Vita, or the good life. So Italy has this freedom to choose its own rhythm, whereas India doesn't. And another example of this is call center. So India is known to have a lot of English speakers who are also extremely highly educated and very well qualified, which means that we are the hub for call centers. But how this works is that because call centers exist in a world um, which is uh, which has a lot of time dimensions, which means that Europe and the United States are the customers from where uh, we the, are the customers that India services. There is also a huge time lag, which means that India functions in the night and it must function and be awake during night hours in order to participate in global development or growth. Uh, the third is flights. So. Uh, Due, due to my frequent flights here in Europe these past couple of years, I've realized that uh, there's a law in Europe which states that there are no international flights that land in the country, like land in Europe post 8 p.m. or during night time. And the reason for this is in order to protect the labor that participates in uh, airports and also to keep public transportation closed at normal hours. However, again, this exists in a global dimension, which means that flights in the developing country have to begin at night. Which means that flight, uh, which means that airports must run at night in the developing world. Which means that public transportation must run at night mm -hmm. in the developing world. Which creates a larger pressure in the country, which also destabilizes rhythms there. And the fourth is holidays and vacations, because a lot of India's growth is based on uh, FDI or investment that comes from outside and corporate growth, etc. Uh, the vacations and holidays that we have become. Um, uh, become the holidays and vacation have to change and be aligned to holidays and vacations that exist in the global north. So for instance, the longest uh, holidays my father gets would be during Christmas period, which is not when we celebrate our festivals, which are Diwali and Ganesh Chaturthi, right? So these festivals get one day off, uh, but Christmas time, when we don't require these things, get 10 days off. And, these breaks a lot, and this breaks a lot of rhythms culturally as well, right? Because then all the pressure of uh, celebrating festivities or participating in traditional culture then comes on to the woman, or in this case, my mother, which again pro propagates them, like uh, sexism. Uh, finally, culturally, also there are several problems. So I come from Bangalore. Uh, our professor was telling you that Bombay is the most important city. That's not true. It's Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, Bangalore is in the south, uh, and the local language or the regional language there is Kannada, which is very different from Hindi, which is the, the local, uh, which is the common language in the north of the country or almost everywhere else. Uh, which means that when Bangalore became uh, a hub for a lot of people to come to and uh, face a lot of growth and development and all these other kinds of things, we had a large influx of population coming from all over the country. And in most other cities in India, uh, the local language and Hindi form a kind of pitkin and you're able to communicate uh, such that the regional language survives, but also there's an acceptance of Hindi in the culture. However, Kannada comes from a different family of languages and this is not possible. And what this did is that English became the local language. But Steven Pinkner in his book, The Language Instinct, says that uh, it takes time for a, pig, a pidgin to build, which means that if, if you have just 10 years for, uh, for a large-scale assimilation to happen between two cultures, it's unlikely that there will be a, a, a pidgin is a assimilation or a, a mixing of two languages such that both languages are understood. However, this, however, Bangalore did not have the time to do this, and that's why we have accepted English as the lingua franca. So there's a breakdown of culture because of this. 
The second point is widening of roads, which our professor already talked about in the case of Dongri, but also specifically in the case of Bangalore, you have a lot of darshanis, which are open style kitchens, which are specifically meant, uh, which specifically feed large, like large populations, extremely fast, and uh, often um, uh, darshanis operate on open on, on the open street and access to them is extremely easy. However, if you have widened the road or created a metro that goes over it, it's impossible to do things like cross the road. It's impossible to do things like be a pedestrian successfully, which means that these, uh, which means that these local institutions also face death uh, and also have to change their form. The third is local architecture. Now, Bangalore is really famous for a specific kind of house, and it's basically a kind of house where you have a coconut tree growing inside the house. So you build the house around the coconut tree. But this is only possible if if there is slow growth. If you don't have to build a house, if you don't have to build housing with a lot of stories or like 14 floors or whatever, and and also uh, building uh, maintain the. Maintaining a tree while you're constructing a house around it requires that you do this process slowly and not abruptly or overnight. Uh, and this local architecture is also really important. Uh, like in India, local architecture is also based on the kind of climate and the temperature that exists there. There are lots of rules of air ventilation and things like that, which all break down when, uh, when the requirements of what development requires change completely, uh, which is really bad for sustainability going into the future. Uh, finally, food and clothing. Uh, so again, uh, so for instance, food. Uh, there was a policy, Green Revolution, uh, in the 70s, which was very important for India to gain a food security. Um, and the decision was to uh, promote rice and wheat. However, both of these ingredients uh, require a lot of resources. Water especially requires a lot of water. And uh, this is extremely bad for a country like India, which faces a lot of heat. And traditionally, if you see, there are thousands of grains that are grown, not thousands, but there are uh, there are a lot of grains that are grown locally that don't use that much water. And there's an extinction of grains that is being faced. Specifically in Maharashtra, one of my favorite dishes uses 12 grains in order to be cooked. But a lot of these grains are now dying out because of this uh, over push of wheat and rice, which does keep a, a fast growing population fed, but it does not really, uh, it's not really development. And finally, clothing, an example of this is that in Udaipur, um, uh, which is a, in a desert portion of the country, uh, there, was, there's a, there, there was this village community that um, the, wi the, the women had a tradition of stitching their own uh, wedding finery before they got wed. And uh, this was seen as a cultural, uh, cultural um, heritage and uh, cultural pride. However, there was an NGO that came to them and they saw that these women were working on their wedding finally for so many months and they thought that this was, uh, this was labor that was being performed that was sexist in nature. And so they said that, okay, why don't you create, uh, why don't you stitch clothes and we'll sell it and you can buy wedding clothes for yourself. And they basically killed this tradition and then decided to call it development. And all in the name of making it fast. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, we have questions. Please feel free to ask questions uh, to the professor. So, mm -hmm. are you sure? I don't think so. Um, so yeah, this was great to give a bit of a particular examples of how it was for you. Yes. And I think it illustrates really well uh, all that what we talked about. If we don't have directly questions on that, uh, I then I have a then. Yeah, so uh, in uh, Hind Swaraj, uh, he, um, Gandhi argues that uh, India remains immovable and that is her glory. He is arguing for a slowing down, for an, 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 an unacceptance of ideas that come purely externally. Um, yeah, that's all. So yeah, um, when we talk about India, automatically Pakistan comes in our mind. So obviously, <laughs> we thought we can like relate the text to Pakistan's case a bit, and we had raised some questions regarding this. So can you move to the next slide? So yeah, uh, according to UNDP, 37.44% uh, of the population uh, in Pakistan is living in the, the cities, and it has the highest rate of urbanization in South Asia and roughly 73 million people are like urbanized. So, and nearly half, by 2025, nearly half of the population will start living in the cities and will be urbanized. So, uh, according to Michael Kugelman in his article, 
two drivers of urbanization in Pakistan is the first is the increase in population and the second one is rural urban migration. So yeah, basically after the partition of India and Pakistan, six to eight million people, uh, Indian Muslims specifically, uh, entered Pakistan and even after war of 1965 and 71, same happened. And in 1980s, there was anti-Soviet insurgency in Afghanistan, due to which um, millions of Afghans entered Pakistan. Uh, that is one of the reasons. And so uh, in Pakistan's case, urbanization is not only about the cities getting bigger, but it is more about the increasing population dense rural regions that is leading to this process and uh, there are many trappings of urban life even in the rural areas so uh, can you move to the next slide yeah so uh, muhammad kadir uh, notes that united nations specifies that if there is an urban space at any area with thousand people per square miles it is classified as an urban space so according to his uh, density-based uh, definition, there, Pakistan, he basically calls these rural localities. So if we consider these rural localities, then Pakistan primarily has 60 to 65% urban, urban cities there. So um, moving to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, urbanization is both problematic and promising for Pakistan. So on one hand, we have the boosting of the economy because the, uh, these cities generate almost 50 to 60 percent of the country's GDP. But on the other hand, this uh, puts and uh, this pressurizes uh, the already stressed labor market in the cities. So uh, and at worst, this urbanization can even lead to radicalization in the urban cities. I'm just skipping most of the parts because we have less time and. So uh, this also raises, oh, sorry, wait, sorry. yeah. So it uh, like raises concerns for the most important sector that is the agricultural sector. So like if this sector is neglected, then how would you absorb that unemployed labor force from there? So there are many questions that are raised after this. So uh, yeah, there is there ha Pakistan has to think of a trade off whether to slow down or to go for urbanization. Uh, next slide. Okay, when there is urbanization, the government or the policies are directed towards the rural poor and how to like help them. So one of the ways is microfinancing. But now I have the question that if you help the people in rural areas with microfinancing, wouldn't they prefer living in urban cities that would lead to more urban sprawl and a burden on the already exhausted system? Mm -hmm. Because as you talk about, um, you know, their thinking and it all is spaced up now. And you cannot slow that down. And for that, decades would be needed to slow it down. So this is uh, one of my questions. And on the next slide, I had another question that uh, one of the major reasons for rural urban migration in Pakistan was uh, is terrorism, as well as war ongoing, especially in the Balochistan region and uh, even in North Waziristan. So there is a lot of like, uh, migration going on. So this is an external factor and is difficult to be controlled. So if Pakistan or any country that has such a context and does want to slow down, as you said, it, we all agree that slowing down is good, it's beneficial, it's, it's sustainable and all that. But then what is the way forward for such a country that is already facing such issues? This is another question and if you go to, yeah, so this was my part and if I know some of you might have questions from your old countries related to this, and if you have, you can ask the questions now. If you want, maybe you can, you can ask answer this uh, first, uh, or yeah, come here to answer for the questions on Pakistan. inequality and um, we are experts to analyze these policies but at the same time we have this government uh, like world government funding smart cities while 
um, within the same um, countries fighting poverty and yet in investing huge in smart cities. For example, um, Saudi Arabia is proposing uh, 500 billion US dollars to build the Lion City. It has uh, a lot of futuristic. Uh, uh, futures, but yet Saudi Arabia has the highest, one of the highest rate of inequalities in the region. So how do we rationalize this? So that is my first question. Uh, my second question is that um, you talked about the caste system in uh, India in a way enforcing inequality and um, I don't know um, land ownership, yeah, or for example decision making or influence um, on on decisions basically, right? Oh, yeah. So I want to know, with increasing globalization and education, isn't this art system supposed to be abolished at this point? Or are Indians generally comfortable with the art system? Yeah, I was expecting that the whole social revolution would have been relegated this art system by now. Yeah, so those are my two questions. Thank you. So much questions. <laughs> 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 Maybe we can ask for the... Yeah, just very quickly. If yeah, I can one respond. last question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very quickly, I can respond and then come yes. to Nira's uh, uh, questions. Uh, so, what, what I... Uh, uh, and then I'll come later on. Uh, because Pakistan is always difficult for Indian students. <laughs> yeah, because they have lots of similarities. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, that is actually trouble with the, uh, I mean, the national government where the huge resources are diverted. If first thing in economics we were taught that economics teaches you how to really spend the resources, hmm? uh, where to allocation of the resources is the basic problem in economics. Uh, what to take care first? Uh, sometimes the cities which actually we are building may not be generating that growth, that what we are actually attributing to them. Hmm? Because if we see the cities may not be generating those growth, for example, the, the glossy cities we are building, uh, the, the distributive uh, growth of the cities like Mumbai is still I say uh, is much more which actually we wanted to make one Shanghai is much more. So uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, I best say that if they just take care of the social inequalities and equities, uh, huge resources being diverted to the uh, creating a glossy city and the glass and other things uh, that may be more good for them I mean obviously they have to look for the post oil economies hmm? uh, that is actually another aspect but uh, huge diversion uh, uh, and simultaneously equal inequality existing in the gender aspect into the non-democracy uh, many other aspects which are actually questionable uh, only the hope uh, with the uh, Saudi Arabia that this regime is progressive regime and I hope that they are uh, King Salman what they call yeah he is more progressive than the predecessors and he is bringing the gender inequality equality and other things into the process but yes it's a huge diversion huge diversion I say uh, uh, like so all actually these countries uh, what we call in uh, sociology uh, which economics does not think about is spectacles. Is the, these are the spectacles to hide so much uh, uh, inequalities and actually the rubbish uh, behind those. So the cities are also hmm, uh, created by those regimes to really divert those basic questions of the sustainability and equality and other. Caste system in India is a huge issue. Uh, people are still struggling. It is not uh, in India. I, I think uh, if you uh, there are there are a group of people uh, who have been banned talking about the caste. Caste in the sense that because they wanted caste equalities, that there is a Varna system we have. She must be knowing uh, the Varna system. Now they are actually come under huge pressure. The lower caste uh, and many of them are being actually what we call naxals hmm? and many of them are imprisoned. Uh, I mean the justice and other is a uh, question of the state to deliver but we felt that perhaps there was a need to look into their grievances of equality much more than what actually branding them in different way. 
so that I say that still caste issue is not resolved. It is abolished, but the social thing which are abolished, they continue in practice many times. Hmm? So it is legally abolished? Legally abolished, okay. socially not. <laughs> that is the trouble. Yeah, Pakistan, we come to uh, the, uh, she, the first question, Munira, are you going to repeat? Yeah, Anika, uh, if you help the people in rural areas with microfinancing, wouldn't they then Anika, want Anika, to like, Anika. upgrade to the urban areas and that would then lead to more urban sprawl and mm. would put pressure on the yes. exhausted system? Okay. Uh, the, the rural... Uh, a, I mean, rural. Uh, w w uh, I'm so sorry. Just I need repetition. I need. Microfinance in rural areas would push rural people to the, towards urban sprawl because there is urbanization. No, no. On, so microfinance. Okay, microfinance. There is a stories of uh, uh, microfinances. I mean, obviously it has done lots of good, but there are lots of trouble also. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that uh, the microfinances does not. There is a one thing which actually I found which. Uh, you are very right. Uh, both in uh, India and Pakistan, the middle classes are moving to the urban areas. That is the truth. Uh, it is uh, not urbanization leading to growth, which recent paper shows, one of mine, but it is the, as income rises, people move to the urban areas, putting pressure. I think that if the government subsidized, uh, microfinance can be provided to the people in uh, in rural areas, uh, people can stay there, not migrating from there. Rural areas, because look at cities are, then actually it may be better, what I felt. Why I say, because you stabilize the population, not people do not rush to the urban center, because urban centers are already clogged. For example, if I, I see uh, Pakistani literature, lots of cities are facing huge water crisis huge water crisis and I see I tell you just be completed one PhD uh, one of my students in Jaipur they say that in 10 years time we don't know where the population will go millions of population because we don't have water for them so the microfinance one way uh, if it is not private driven it is government driven subsidized. Huh, subsidized because at the low I don't know whether the interest rate count continues on the microfinance uh, uh, for uh, like in India, we have microfinance, uh, which is actually highly uh, uh, interest rate oriented. Mm. I don't know whether it is. And uh, uh, this 24%, uh, 22%, and in agriculture, productivity is 1% to 2%. From where the person is going to pay for the microfinance? Hmm? I say that, that is what I say. Uh, uh, this is a huge, huge expert driven uh, thing unless it is subsidized uh, microfinance is not answer in fact if you provide microfinance they may be getting eroded of their income and they will ultimately rush i just tell you one story one thing i was actually for six months in london school of economics i was teaching something some students came to me and meet me and they were british they asked me that they want to work in india i said welcome Come please, India, we would like. I said, where? I said, where do you want to work? Sir, I have done my, I mean, doing in the banking. And I want to come in microfinance. And I knew the story. That in, they are paid hugely in microfinance. In order to spread this microfinance, collect the interest rate of 24% to 36%, and divert, erosion, erode the income and wealth of the people who take the finances. So one thing is that they monetize their economy, uh, household, and they divert through that to this. I did a for NCR. NCR is a banking company which manufactured this earlier, all the ATM machines initially. Uh, now it is there. They started it initially in, Brit in Britain. In Maharashtra, I found that there was no microfinance, private microfinance-led household which has not having the second dose of the loan. First dose was to really take the consumption. Second dose was to pay the whatsoever they have borrowed. And then third, and ultimately you have indebted household. And these indebted household will rush to the cities to earn. 
So if you have the microfinance working in a reverse way, basically what they do, they monetize their wealth. They have the traditional land uh, asset which are there and they will all this get monetized. So what the many people have said that it is the capital way of integrating the periphery and those asset which are not monetized. <coughs> so those are those in the market, not market, marketize those. Financialization of resources. That happens and this financialization ultimately lead to the exploitation. Hmm? And some of them succeed, but many of them do not. I tell you many of them, 90% of the household we found that basically the second dose came from that and ultimately the whole household income may be eroded. The second one, very important <coughs> part you uh, pointed out, the radicalization. The inequalities in the cities are simmering. You look at the Paris itself. Look at the Mumbai. Look at, and the people because of inequalities are living in ghettos. And these ghettos, because if you are not having enough income, it is always psychological pressure on you. You have to run a house, you have to feed the children, you have to do something, and then there will be some people who will bring the solution for this through the crime method. Hmm? And this crime method, which is national gang, international gang, you are already then attracted. Because it is not that the people are born criminal. Society makes the criminals. And who makes them? We are responsible for that. A state some way, if the state is the mother of looking after all the children, the state if the makes the children. This is not the society. Uh, society. We are not. So if you have segregated population, you, you, you see that these people are doing, if they don't have income, they will deal with the drug. That is, if the state does not provide them income, it is no, in, uh, society is not inclusive, uh, it is exclusionary, on many count it can be exclusionary. And that may result into that. And I say that also leads to the geopolitical, I mean, uh, issue, which is already, I mean, what she pointed out from the uh, Pakistan, that is large, huge geopolitic, geopolitical. Uh, one thing, we were child, I mean, I think the India, Pakistan, because we have relative in both the countries. Hmm? Some of my own family migrated other side. We remained here because in India because we say that that is our country, our soil. We don't go. Hmm? Uh, we will not move out from Lucknow. Hmm? And that is very important. We were Gandhian. <coughs> Gandhian, you think? Uh, all of you. We were not, we will not move out because this is country which people are dividing who are really p doing politics, not actually doing good things. Hmm? Still, this simmering both sides that the country wa countries were divided not on the rational ground but something else. So we can experience that we, one thing we were told, told in our childhood through our mother, father and other traditional method, that one thing you do, do not harm mother. Hmm? Do not do. Uh, who will train those children who are becoming radicalized now? If you do not have grandparents, parents to shape them, the school, the morality which used to come from the families, uh, I don't say that every morality was good like caste system, but there were some moralities which were coming from the societies that become non-violent. Adhere to that. Do your work, do your karma, what we say. Uh, and continue. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, I'm so sorry, just, so I uh, continue, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I know that there are yeah. so much questions. And there are two so, uh, questions from them as well. I, don't know exactly what I will just start with one question we have. Maybe you can collect one or two more questions and then uh, we can answer to whatever you And it might be your questions as well. Yeah, but right. in 10 minutes it's over yeah. Yeah. because you have another seminar at two, so uh, yeah. we need to be ready for that. Very, very focused. Sorry. So, um, yeah, I will start and it's. Uh, it's not here. It's here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so um, you can stay here. It will be really fast. So it's um, so the Israel cities movement was born in the global north. Um, well, the yeah. But at the same time, you mentioned a lot how uh, there's also slow urbanism or, of course, slow ways of living in the global south as well uh, around cities, even uh, even now. Um, 
So while the slow cities movement values uh, also an increased contact with communities, it is still quite different from the ways uh, of slow living coming from the south. Um, and there are also many differences between the cities in the global north that are going slow now and the cities in the global south. So giving all of this, uh, my questions are, what challenges do you see in applying a mo the model of the slow cities coming from the north to cities in the, in the south? And in which ways do you see the slow urbanism movement complementary or in contrast with traditionally slow modes of living coming from the south? Uh, I think that global south or global north, what the slow cities they call, is already present in India. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, already they are in slow mode. Uh, the characteristic they mentioned uh, in the slow city manifesto, that meets that requirement. They are offering the local context, they are offering the local food, they are offering the local hospitalities, uh, they are actually not importing anything and feeding you, but they are doing from that. The many of the cities which are there in the uh, global south, and I, I, I can tell from the India's context, uh, I think that they are already in slow mode. What actually we are doing, we are pushing them. We are pushing them to the level where actually uh, turn into the uh, uh, fast cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so already there are many context-based, geography-based uh, things. And I think it will be good. Because slow city movement, although they have put a manifesto, but the trouble is that manifesto may not be, uh, again, applicable in every context. Uh, that is territorial specificity that need to be really looked. Second very important aspect which I would like to bring here, they have put 50,000 population as a benchmark. In India, <laughs> even district towns are about uh, half million. Um, so five lakh. Like. And that same thing actually in Pakistan and other places. So you have to really increase the population size. So in then those. Maybe as a follow-up, um, then what utility do you see from the slow movement, slow cities movement, why do you see it's useful to use this for the global side, or like to talk about even this movement, if there is already everything needed? In no, no, why, uh, this utility is enormous, because what happens? There are two ways to project it. We are taught, one is that in the textbook, we are taught that how to really grow. And that every day in the classroom to the newspapers, we are being fed. That you leave the our traditional, there is a new thing coming which is very good. Hmm? Uh, what, what I felt that, that these cities which are there, they also need to find their places in the ministry. Hmm? And the utility is already there for the context they are existing. But be as a uh, policy maker tomorrow, or actually a academics who are teaching the new generations, uh, we need to understand that there is lots of importance of these cities and we need to really preserve those cities. Obviously, we need to overcome many inequalities, that there is nothing, everything perfect. They may be suffering from caste inequality, they may be suffering Indian cities and Pakistani and Bangladeshis, may be suffering from uh, gender inequalities. So that may be there, but we need to really overcome them and continue practicing that. Thank you. Yeah. So Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just, I want to understand, is it possible to develop in countries like India, Nigeria, Pakistan have the leeway to pursue slow growth? Because it looks like these countries are now in a dilemma. I'm building up on Anika's questions about um, wars in, in Nigeria, for example. There are a lot of, there's a lot of terrorism, kidnapping going on in local um, or rural areas in Nigeria. That's already pushing I, people I, to the I, I, urban I, I, region. So do we really have the leeway to... Um, detach ourselves from the political influence of the global north and pursue this slow growth that we I, 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 I'm with you. Because what so what I have seen in India, because I, I have been in three commissions of the government of India, where I was supposed to, uh, de de why the religious wars in India is continuing, religious inequalities in India. Uh, you see that this, these are not the common people who are grassrooted uh, in the uh, smaller cities. These are the people in the middle classes who have the uh, aspiration for getting wealth and income very soon. Uh, they are the people who want to grow fast. They want to displace each other. Hmm? So this is where actually the war is coming. If you have slow moderation, moderated form of growth, not actually the slow, suddenly what has done in the world, 
globalization. I mean, I don't blame everything globalization, but we have somewhere in academia also gone wrong. We have taught everybody that you can grow rich very soon and very quickly and without any consequences. That is not truth. There are many consequences of this uh, 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 thing. Uh, so American dream, which actually coming to the uh, uh, global south uh, in terms of generating wealth and income is actually troublesome uh, because this can create the middle class who, who can go on war path. In India, we see that more income, um, wheresoever the middle classes have risen. Uh, and I think this is true from Nigeria also. There is a strife. There is a caste war, there is a uh, religious war. What we call in India uh, communalism. Communalism. So that actually prevails. That, that. And I, my question, I guess, is how much do you think that, um, like, how much the tensions between the two countries uh, relate to um, us not being able to slow down? And also, if that's true, how important, like, what is the way forward? Uh, because, again, all the terrorism and the wars and the tensions, uh, that leads to a lot of movement to the major cities. And, like, how is it possible or practical that we have this moment in our countries uh, with before solving the problem? <coughs> Uh, in India and Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, I say that these these two countries were product of the aspiration of the middle class for fostering their income. Hmm? Uh, the, if you see the whole uh, uh, national movement for India and Pakistan, uh, they were product of the middle classes. And these middle classes want, wanted political power through the creation of the wealth and other things. The one thing, their production itself is not the lo located in, in the uh, uh, poorer classes or the people who are actually in the slow mode. They were not product of those. Second thing, uh, what I feel the conflict and other thing, I feel that till now Indus Water Treaty has worked a lot. Hmm? The one source which can be tomorrow, because India for generating wealth in northern region may die, uh, I mean assume that already there are two disputes going on. Uh, tomorrow water is diverted. Uh, assume that they, they do not adhere to uh, because they need water in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, they want, need in Himachal Pradesh, they need in Punjab. Uh, the resource sharing for fast growth can be another question which actually may enter into that. Hmm? So that these two uh, 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 issues are there. Uh, uh, which I feel that, uh, and both of them are building cities. They are building uh, machines for generating growth, which is faster, faster, faster. Okay, maybe various. Hello, Milana. Thank you very much for that is it possible for already existing past uh, cities to slow down and so given that slow cities are have this huge idiosyncratic uh, component, how would be those tensions between fragmented societies that we already have been uh, can be handled in terms of uh, democracy and also in terms of uh, Customs and uh, interests and objectives that different communities that already coexist in the uh, past city. Being, uh, yeah, very important question, I must say. Okay, but you have one minute. One minute. Uh, sorry. Uh, so sorry. Uh, uh, first thing is the state. A state has turned into entrepreneurial state. That is the trouble in the neoliberal regimes. So now, what is happening? If the state moves to the direction which is somewhere displaced like pendulum. Second is that whether there is a leader born who can take into account those things as some movement either from the people uh, themselves or actually somebody is mobilizing them. So these two solutions possibly I can look into. Uh, I, I see uh, that, that that possibility remains and very important fragmented societies within the fast cities they are threat to the people themselves because as she said they can be threat to many things in the crime. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.